Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the County of Union, New Jersey at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday, April 29th, 2014 in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and to transact any other business that may properly come before the board. This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be recorded in the minutes that in compliance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield School Board on Friday, April 25th, 2014, caused to be posted at the Office of the, office of the Board of Education <coughs> oh, yeah. located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey, and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, the Town Clerk of Westfield, the Alternative Press, and Patch.com. A meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of the meeting. Is there a roll call? Rich Matesek. Here. Lucy Beagler. Ann Carey. Here. Mark Friedman. Brendan Galligan. Jean oh. Jean oh. Here. Ginny Lights. Here. Gretchen Olive. Here. Mitch Slater. Here. And could you leave some flags? Please well, uh, join me. I pledge to allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands. stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Consent notifications. Um, announcements Any tonight. We wanted to start with a special announcement. Dr. Bowen. Yes. Um, actually, a few months ago, Westfield High School senior Alexa Derman came to one of our board meetings, some of you might remember. And actually, she was congratulating me for something, a special recognition. Um, so last week, I extended an invitation to Alexa to join us so that we could recognize her on her many significant accomplishments this year. But in addition to my personal congratulations, I know that the Board of Education would like to recognize Alexa as well. So I will now turn this over to Mr. Matesic. Absolutely, we would. Alexa, you want to come on up? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Since there are so many recent honors that you have received, I'd like to just read a few of them in chronological order, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, on the weekend of April 4th through 6th, Alexa served as one of three officers who helped to run the Youth and Government Conference held in Trenton and attended by more than 550 students. At that conference, she was selected along with three classmates to attend the Council on National Affairs Conference in North Carolina this summer. On May 1st, Alexa will be the recipient of a Governor's Award in Arts Education. Given to about 80 students in the state, students qualify for this award by winning another statewide competition. Not only did she win another competition, she won two of them, mm -hmm. one through the New Jersey Council of Teachers of English in creative nonfiction, and the, and the other through the Playwrights Theater of New Jersey for winning their Young Playwrights competition. On June 3rd, Alexa's play, which won the New Jersey Young Playwrights competition, will be performed by actors at Keene University. There are only four high school winners chosen in the entire state. On June 6th, <laughs> Alexa will be given an award at a ceremony at Carnegie Hall for the National Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Alexa won three gold medals, representing the top one half of 1% one in dramatic script, and one in personal essay, mem memoir, and one in flash fiction. On June 12th through June 15th, <laughs> one of Alexa's plays is being performed professionally in Los Angeles as a winner of the Blank Theater Young Playwrights Festival performances. It's a national playwriting competition. She has been asked to be there for rehearsals. And from June 23rd to the 28th, <laughs> Alexa will attend the International Thespian Society Festival, which is, like the theater, which is like the theater's National Honor Society, where members, mostly actors,
from across the country will convene. The four winners of the National Playwriting Competition get to attend for free, and this includes Alexa. Her play will be published in the Thespian Society's national magazine, Dramatics, and possibly anthologized next year by Samuel French, one of the big, biggest play publishers in the country. So Alexa, this certificate of recognition <laughs> from the Westfield Board of Education may pale in comparison to those extraordinary recognitions, but be assured that we could not be prouder of you. We know, you'll, we know that we'll be hearing great things from you in the years to come. And so Alexa, the Board of Education of Westfield, congratulates you as the recipient of the 2014 Governor's Award in Arts Education for Outstanding Achievement in the Arts and for all of your accomplishments. Congratulations. <laughs> Terrific job. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll go to other announcements. Brendan, anything about your own? Yeah, this comes from the high school. Westfield High School Principal Peter Renwick has been appointed to the Education Commission of the States, joining a nationwide nonpartisan interstate organization devoted to education at all levels. Mr. Renwick was appointed to the post by the governor and will represent the state of New Jersey, working side by side with key education leaders from around the nation to improve education across the 50 states and its territories. In response to this announcement, Acting State Education Commissioner David Hespe stated, I would like to congratulate Peter Renwick, who will join me in representing New Jersey on the Education Commission of the States, a nationally recognized organization that analyzes educational research and creates opportunities for education leaders to learn from each other. Peter was a member of the Governor's College and Career Readiness Task Force, which I chaired in 2012. So I know he understands the need to provide our students with a 21st century education. He will be an effective representative for New Jersey. Congratulations. I also have an announcement from the high school. Congratulations to the following Westfield High School seniors for receiving honorable mention in the annual Moody's Mega Math Challenge. Matt Lupino, Lucia Liu, Cindy Chow, Mark Gillespie, and Alex Beals. They submitted a 20-page paper with documentation to support their work. And out of over 2,600 teams that registered, they were among the 52 teams that were selected to the second round. A $1,000 scholarship prize will be split between the five members of the Westfield High School team. Moody's judges sent the following message to teacher advisor Les Jacobson. You and your team should be very proud of this distinction, especially given the rigorous and intense scrutiny that each paper endured and the fact that only 5.6% of the submitted papers were selected for recognition. Congratulations on your team's superior paper. I have another announcement from the high school that Westfield Public Schools third, oh actually it's not just the high school, but the third annual Cafe Culturel held this month at the high school included more than 600 participants who experienced a taste of different cultures. Fifth grade students participating in the district Spanish program were invited <coughs> to display projects at the event as well as share a favorite recipe. The cafeterias were filled with music, food, and projects students had worked on in Spanish courses that described themselves and their daily routines. The students and parents who attended the event provided all of the delicious and interesting cultural food. And I have one more, which is near and dear to my heart. The 17th annual Jefferson Jubilee was enjoyed by a sold out crowd at Westfield High School Saturday and Sunday, March 29th and 30th. Almost 400 Jefferson children participated in this year's show, dancing to the theme, moving and grooving. Jubilee is a Jefferson tradition that caps off months of planning by parent volunteers and after-school practices for the student. It was my 11th and my last, so <laughs> I'm <all> sad, <laughs> but it was great fun. That's it. And more good news from the high school. Isabella Gelfand, a Westfield High School sophomore, was the recipient of this year's Mark Wesley Hardy Human Rights Award given annually to a young person for outstanding commitment to human rights. 
Isabella received the award for her extensive involvement with Girls Learn International, a nonprofit organization that supports universal education for girls. She currently serves as the Vice President Treasurer of the Westfield High School Chapter and a member of the New York, New Jersey Regional GLI Junior Board. Isabella recently prepared and then actively participated for the third year at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Previously, Isabella was one of 20 delegates selected nationwide on behalf of Girls Learn International. This year, Isabella was selected to be one of 10 delegates to the UN Commission on the Status of Women on behalf of the Working Group on Girls. Isabella co-moderated a panel discussion on girls' rights and made presentations to various missions to the United Nations on the issue of child marriage. Additionally, several members of the Westfield High School and Roosevelt Intermediate School chapters of Girls Learn International participated in the celebration held in Manhattan of the 10th anniversary of the organization. Isabella acted as a panelist along with Eleanor Schmiel, president of the Feminist Majority Foundation. Westfield High School chapter leader Melanie Nettler and Roosevelt chapter leader Deanna Henchuk along with chapter members from throughout the country. First Lady of New York City, Shirlane McRae, spoke about the importance of youth activism. Honored guests included Lisa Alter, a former Westfield Board of Education member, and her two daughters, Jordana and Ariel, Girls Learn International co-founders. Congratulations, Isabella. Okay, good news from Edison Intermediate School. The Southern Poverty Law Center Teaching Tolerance Program has named Edison Intermediate School as a model school for its exemplary efforts to foster respect and understanding among students and throughout campus during 2013-2014 school year. Edison is one of 76 schools across the country receiving the honor for encouraging Mix It Up Day. Edison was among the 6,000 schools that participated in teaching Tolerance's Mix It Up at Lunch Day program, an effort to break down the barriers between students so there were fewer misunderstandings that can lead to conflicts, bullying, and harassment. On Mix It Up Day, November 2013, Edison held a school-wide assembly followed by teacher-facilitated discussion groups. During lunch, students, during lunch, students made new friends at grade level tables and afterwards the entire student body and staff participated in team building games, mixing students with sit schools 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. In notifying Edison of its, dis its distinction, the director of the Teaching Tolerance Project wrote, in today's polarized world, it's refreshing to see schools that are doing extraordinary things to encourage students, faculty, and staff to cross the social boundaries that so often divide us. By recognizing these schools and calling attention to their great work, we hope that other schools will follow their lead. Roosevelt Intermediate School in Westfield officially began using its outdoor classroom this month when the weather cooperated. Thanks to funding from the school's parent-teacher student organization, the Student Council, and the Education Fund of Westfield, Roosevelt teachers can schedule their classes in the new open airspace adjacent to the school, which is surrounded by a low wall, which can be used for seating. Okay. Well, I have the honor of announcing the winner of this year's recipient of the Westfield Rotary Philhauer Fellowship for Outstanding Teacher at the Elementary Grades. And the winner this year is Coral Venturino, who teaches fourth grade at Wilson School. Uh, Mrs. Venturino began her career in Westfield in 1990, is taught at both the Wilson and the Washington schools. She has experience at the kindergarten level, second grade, fourth grade, as a resource room teacher, and primary enrichment program teacher. The Board of Ed will honor her at our next board meeting, uh, May 6th, with a reception at 7 p.m. in Wilson's auditorium, preceding the business portion of our meeting. Earlier that day, Mrs. Venturino will be the guest of honor at the Rotary Club's luncheon. Congratulations. And <clears throat> more congratulations in fine arts from the high school. Congratulations to David Grus Gruskin. 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 Thank you. Senior at Westfield High School who was selected and performed as the trumpet player with the Central Jersey Music Educators Association Region 2 Jazz Ensemble. Uh, April 14th at Rawway High School. And in addition, congratulations to Westfield High School senior Fraser Wiest, 
who has been named one of 565 semifinalists in the country to advance to the final round of the 2014 United States Presidential Scholars Competition. This award recognizes our nation's most distinguished graduating high school seniors. In 1979, the program extended its requirements to include exceptional talent in the visual, creative, and performing arts. So we congratulate David and Frazier. Well done. More from the high school. <laughs> um, the Westfield High School Youth and Government Club returned with an impressive array of awards, including outstanding delegation for this year's conference held at the State House in Trenton from April 4th to April 6th. More than 550 students from high schools across New Jersey participated in the program, including 72 freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors representing Westfield High School. Samantha Gruskin, Alexa Derman, and Corin Kramer served as officers for the conference, having worked throughout the year to help organize and prepare to run the conference. Outstanding delegate awards were run by Margaret Mayo, Jonathan Kelly, Andrew Zale, and Frank Guerrero. Three of the eight possible outstanding legislation awards were earned by Jared Kagan, Brianna Reinhardt, and Ben Kelly. They were recognized for the quality of the bills they wrote for the conference. Of the eight premier statesman awards presented at the conference, both Andrew Zale and Frank Guerrero were recipients. In the Judiciary Committee, the award for premier first year delegate was given to Margaret Mayo. The Outstanding, Outstanding Executive Response Committee Delegate Award was given to Jonathan Kelly. In addition, Frank Guerrero, Elizabeth, Isabella Gelfand, Andrew Kunetsov, Ed Delisaro, Jared Bansky, and Maya Johnson passed bills at the conference. Elected as officers for next year's conference were Andrew Kunetsov, Andrew Zell, Corin Kramer, Ed Delisaro, Frank Guerrero, and Brianna Reinhardt. Selected to attend the Council on National Affairs Conference this summer in North Carolina were Alexa Derman, Isabella Gelfand, J.D. Kelly, and Frank Guerrero. Ellie Smith, Jill Rosenfeld will serve as CONA alternates. Wow, so congratulations. All right, the next Board of Education meeting will be held at Wilson Elementary School on Tuesday, May 6th. And as mentioned, the business portion of the meeting will be preceded by a reception beginning at 7 p.m. to honor Coral Venturino as the Phil Hauer recipient. And with that, we'll move to the public hearing on the 2014-2015 budget. And Dr. Dole. Yes, and for that, I, I'd like to turn to our business administrator, Dana Sullivan. Okay, good evening. So, to start off, I wanted to review the calendar for the budget. Um, the, the calendar of this year is a little different, um, which is why we're holding the public hearing later than we usually do. Um, the On March 4th and March 11th, we had detailed presentations for the board. And on March 11th, the board approved a tentative budget, which we submitted to the county superintendent for her review. Um, she approved that about March 24th. However, the state requirements this year changed, and we were required to hold our um, public hearing between April 24th and May 7th. So that's why we haven't had a presentation or a discussion of the budget, because nothing has changed since that time until now. Um, on April 24th, last Thursday, we advertised the notice of the meeting as well as the budget itself in the Westfield Leader. Um, and tonight we are holding the public hearing. Um, so tonight we're doing a brief presentation of um, what we've already, highlighting some of the things we've already talked about in the past meetings. So in the 14-15 budget, we, the district has a number of initiatives and we've been able to continue funding all of our programs and initiatives in the next year's budget. Um, and to highlight a few, we have a literacy initiative, um, a technology initiative, um, we have new requirements um, with our park testing that we, we've included funding in the budget for. Um, we're continuing funding for our STEM program. Um, continuing all of our funding for mandated programs and academic support. Um, 
we are maintaining all of our existing class sizes at all levels of, of um, middle, elementary, and high school. Um, we are maintaining all of our co-curricular athletic and fine arts programs as they are. Um, we do have a increase, projected increase at the high school of enrollment, and we've provided some resources to um, provide extra teaching staff for that enrollment increase. Um, we have sufficient funds to maintain all of our facilities. The tax levy increase in the budget is at the state adjusted cap. And this budget does reflect an increase in state aid of $66,677. Um, and that is a increase of $124,000 in our basic state aid, um, offset by a decrease in our debt service aid of $57,000. So the revenue portion of our budget, our total budget is about $99.5 million. Um, the total operating budget, which is the portion of our budget that supports all of our academic programs and all of our facilities, is $94.7 million. Um, you can see the bulk of that $94.7 million comes from local taxes. Um, state aid does show a de an increase there of $124,000, as I mentioned previously. Um, we have a small amount of revenue that we receive from the special, educa special education Medicaid initiative, which is um, funding that's available to us for children uh, who come from families that qualify for, for Medicaid. Um, we are continuing to appropriate from our fund balance, um, and we're continuing at the same level as we had in the 13-14 year, school year, which is $1.4 million. And then we have miscellaneous other revenues um, that we're projecting $335,000 in revenue, and that would be include building rental income, student activity fees, um, as well as interest income. <clears throat> the, uh, in the 13-14 school year, you'll see several amounts there that do not show in the 14-15 year, and those are amounts for purchase orders that roll over from the prior <coughs> year. Um, so they will not be reflected in the 14-15 budget until July of 2014. Um, same thing with maintenance reserve. Um, we haven't used any maintenance reserve as of this point in the 2014-15 year. Um, so the total adjusted operating budget is $94.7 million. The other areas of the budget in the revenue section are special revenue, um, which is our state and federal grants. Um, and we are given th that money for a designated purpose. Um, we are only able to budget for grants that we have received official notification that we are going to receive, um, and that's why you'll see a decrease there. Um, as the 2014-15 <coughs> year goes on and we receive notification from the state on um, grants that we receive, that number will increase um, both on the revenue side and the expenditure side. And our debt service has increased um, the the state aid decreased a little bit, um, so our tax levy had to increase to make up for that. Um, and that's for debt service on the bonds that have already been sold um, in the district. And so our total revenue is $99.5 million. And just a breakdown of our state aid, the um, categories that we received in 2013-14 were transportation aid, special ed aid, and security aid. And those amounts have stayed flat for the 14-15 school year. Um, the state added two new types of aid for the 14-15 school year called park readiness aid and per pupil growth aid. And although they have a name like park readiness, it really is basic state aid that can be used for any purpose. Um, so it's not designated aid, although they've, they've named it um, something that sounds like it's designated. Um, our extraordinary special ed aid is aid that that's not a basic aid. That's an aid that we have to submit an application for. So that number is an estimate. Um, we haven't even received notification yet on our 1314 amount. So that's still an estimate of a million dollars. Um, in the past, we have received a little bit more than that. So we're, we think that estimate is, is um, pretty accurate. But we won't know until later on in this year for, for 1314, and we won't know till probably the end of next year for 14-15. Um, and then, as I mentioned, debt service aid um, was reduced slightly by $57,000. And so the expenditure side of our budget, um, this is a breakdown of how our money is spent. 
Um, 61.6 percent of our budget goes directly to instruction, so that's for teachers, um, classroom supplies, and anything having to do with direct in instruction. The next biggest piece of the um, budget there is 8.4 percent for child study team services, um, related services, which is our OT, our occupational therapy, and our physical therapy, and other child support. Um, and then extraordinary services, which are personal aids and um, other expenses directly for students. So, you know, that would also be an instructional uh, cost. It's just termed differently in our budget per the state guidelines. Um, another part that's the, the health guidance and library is all direct student support. So that's our nurses, our guidance counselors, and our librarians. Um, and those three pieces together make up over 75% of the budget. So over 75% of the budget does go directly to our students. Um, and then you can see the other pieces of the budget. We have 2.7% going to transportation costs, um, principals and, and school secretaries and, and other building um, supplies, school supplies, I mean, I'm sorry, office supplies for the schools um, is in building administration, which makes up 4.4% of our budget. Um, our technology and central office um, salaries and supplies make up about 4.8% of our budget. Um, athletics make up about 1.2% of our budget. That's all our coaches and um, fees and supplies for our teams. Um, our co-curricular costs make up about 4% of our budget and then 7.5% um, of, per of our budget is utilities, insurance, and maintenance costs. Um, and then 3.2% is for debt service, which I had mentioned earlier. Dana, where does uh, out-of-district special ed fall into that chart? It, it's in the CST related services and extraordinary, okay. in that 8.4. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. so that's the shortened version of our budget um, that you've had um, many more details from before. If there's any questions from the board, I'd be happy to answer them. Anyone? I just note uh, in Mark's absence, he's out sick tonight, but he did send me an email just to recognize um, Dr. Dolan, all your work on the budget, and Dana, all of your work on the budget. And he sends his thanks to to both of you and, and, and all the staff that, that worked on the budget over the past uh, several months. So we've had the benefit of, of hearing multiple presentations. Um, and the Finance Committee, with which Mark's chairs, heard even more presentations. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all the, uh, for all the hard work. Anyone else from the board? I would then um, ask whether there are any, I would recognize the public for questions uh, and or comments on the budget. All right, seeing no one come to the podium, then Dana, uh, can I move to the resolutions? Yep. So I would ask uh, with respect to the adoption of the 2014-2015 <coughs> school year budget, excuse me, and tax levy, uh, that the board consider the following <coughs> resolutions. Resolve that the Westfield Board of Education hereby adopts the 2014-2015 school year budget and uh, be it resolved that there should be raised for the general fund $88,967,333 for the ensuing school year 2014-2015 and be it resolved that there should be raised for debt service fund $2,848,413 for the ensuing school year 2014-2015. Do I have a second? second? Mitch, thank you. Any comments or questions? All right, Dana. Mr. Tessick? Yes. Lucy Beagler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. <coughs> Jenny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. <coughs> All right, thank you. With that, we'll move to the superintendent's report. Yes, <coughs> so we, <coughs> we have two reports. The first one, <coughs> Uh, we've talked a number of times at this table this year about technology, which isn't surprising. Technology certainly has changed all of our lives on a daily basis, and um, it is truly, <coughs> I, truly exciting uh, how it is changing education. And uh, I think we're very fortunate in Westville because um, two of our um, experienced teachers in the district not only um, 
are skilled in their fields of teaching, but they also have a passion for technology and they uh, are now working for us in uh, positions where they get to share that understanding and passion with other teachers. So I'd like to, to <coughs> for the presentation, I'd like to introduce both Janine Gatko and Adam Peasy. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you all for being here and for having us to present to you. Um, our goal of our presentation tonight is to give you an overview of what we've done over the past year and to kind of talk to you about where we're going with our instructional technology program that Adam and I have been working on. So we have some slides that we want to present to you and as we go through, we'll explain you know a little bit about each one and then we'll give you some time for questions at the end. All right, so again, thanks for having us. Um, we wanted to start off the presentation with kind of just going back to the vision and objective that was clearly established uh, about two years ago with the walls to window presentation and the um, district initiative. Um, I'm not going to read the two paragraphs on the screen here, but I will certainly point out um, as Janine and I work with teachers and students, we're constantly going back to the vision that was established. Um, a couple of things within the vision that I wanted to point out, we are absolutely trying to create 21st century learners. And we're also trying to create environments within the classrooms that are you know, digitally advanced and where students are solving problems with technology. And also trying to create um, as much as we can authentic worlds within the classroom and bring, bring that to the classroom. And the way we do that is we base it on um, these three C's. So when we're working with teachers, when we're working in the classroom, when we're working with any type of instruction, we try to bring it back to, you know, are we focusing on communication and collaboration, um, creativity, and especially with our students' critical thinking, preparing them for the world that they're going into. So we kind of refer to it as the three C's when we're talking about educational technology. Again, as I think uh, Dr. Dolan alluded to, this is uh, the second year of this position that we have master tech teachers within the district. Um, one of the thing that one of the some of the things that guide us, um, we're not just working with best practices that Janine and I are coming up with on our own. We're constantly going back to the ISTE standards. Uh, we're looking at the Common Core standards that have been established uh, at the national level, and we also have our eye as well on the park testing that's coming up and how students are going to be tested. Uh, that sort of informs how we're going to instruct teachers and students uh, with respect to educational technology. Another key component is the technical infrastructure that through the Walls to Windows initiative was set up on the um, informational technology side. So through Brian Ocker's department, the wireless access that has been improving throughout the district, the computer labs at the middle and high school level, the mobile labs at the elementary, middle and high school level with iPads and this year with new mm -hmm. laptops. Um, our elementary teachers received new teacher laptops this year that they're very excited about using in their classrooms. We have a pilot BYOD program going on at the high school and moving on to um, the virtualization concept that Brian Ocker has discussed at prior meetings. Um, this piece of it is key. We work very closely with the informational technology um, department to make sure those things are in place because if those things are in place, what we do won't really work. So we've been really fortunate to work with their great staff. So we've been in prior meetings. There's been a lot of uh, lots of change with respect to instructional technology, even in the last two years. So I, we kind of wanted to put a slide together, uh, sort of uh, listing some of the big changes that have taken place within education and technology, and blending the two together. Um, there's learning management systems, flipped classrooms, blended learning, STEM, BYOD, and Web 2.0. Um, we've adopted some of these strategies in the classroom. Obviously, we're going with a new learning management system this year. Um, some of the teachers out there are beginning to flip their classrooms using technology to sort of, you know, maybe film themselves uh, teaching a lesson uh, where the kids can go ahead and watch it at home and then bring instruction back into the classroom the next day. Um, we've got the STEM initiatives and we're supporting that as well. Um, I think Janine mentioned it. Um, there is a BYOD pilot that's happening in the high school now. Uh, we're looking at the results, we're, we're analyzing those results and seeing if we can move forward with that into next year. Um, so we have a vision, obviously, as well as the board has a vision um, of what a 21st century classroom in Westfield, you know, should look like, can look like, and is starting to look like in our district. And in order to, you know, get to that point where we like our students to be, and of course it's changing and evolving, we've come up with and we work with these three pillars that we feel are necessary to support that vision of a 21st century learning environment. 
Um, we're going to talk to each one of those, but one of them is the learning management system. Um, another one is digital tools within the classroom and for teachers to use. And the third one, uh, just as important, is the professional development that we do with our teachers. So pillar one, like I mentioned, is our learning management system. Edline was one of our big initiatives this year. Um, we have, in last week, just rolled out an initial launch of our new front-facing public web um, site system. We trained approximately 680 teachers, staff, um, support staff, and administration on the new um, Edline website and learning management system. It will be fully a learning management system in the fall of 2014 um, when students and parents will have logins and teachers will be using it even more dynamically within their classrooms. We've completed about 20 different types of PD after school for teachers. We've worked um, tirelessly in the classrooms with teachers on Edline and also through one-on-one -on -one consultations. One of the other initiatives we started this year uh, is Google Apps for Education uh, within the district. Uh, we're just piloting this year. Um, basically, Google Apps will give students and teachers uh, cloud-based storage and the suite of Google applications that can be applied for the classroom. Uh, it's you know one of the things that we're going to be looking at. Again, we piloted it this year, and we're going to be looking to roll it out next year if successful. And then we also still have in place our Genesis system for grade reporting, working with you know teachers on how to best manage their classrooms, manage their grades, reporting to parents what's going on in the classroom. So pillar two, um, this is a brief list of some of the digital tools that we work with in classrooms and we also help train teachers on so they can bring it to their students. As you know with educational technology things are constantly changing, there's new tools, you know it feels like to Adam and I almost every day that we're learning something so part of our job is to research how these tools work but also best practices for bringing them into the classroom and working with the students. Um, so we're going to highlight a few of these so you can see exactly what we're talking about and how we're using them within the classroom. So if we go to the next slide, Adam's going to talk a little bit about BlendSpace. Yes, this is one of the favorites amongst the high school teachers. This is a digital platform where teachers are curating digital lessons for their students. Um, as you can see on sort of the uh, screen here, a teacher has created a lesson, if you will, on the Kent State uh, killings in 1970, I believe my date's right on that. Um, but they've gathered together a bunch of resources all in one sort of space, if you will, for the students. So you've got a YouTube video, you've got uh, some readings, you've got a quiz for the kids to take. And again, it sort of centralizes the lesson for the kids. Uh, very easy to sort of uh, execute on this. And again, a lot of the teachers of the high school have been using this platform. Um, another platform that both teachers at all levels, the middle, high school, and elementary schools have been using is Nearpod, which is an app for the iPad. So last year we started bringing this in with our new iPad initiative. Basically what it is, is an interactive presentation that a teacher runs on a single iPad. Each student or groups of students has an iPad and they follow along with that presentation. The great thing about it is that it takes a normal PowerPoint or interactive whiteboard, whiteboard, excuse me, whiteboard presentation and it allows the teacher to add more interactive elements to it. So for example, a quiz or a response type of feature. The teacher also has the ability while giving this presentation to monitor the students as they're responding and to adjust their lessons as needed. This is an example here of a librarian who's using it to present on a particular topic she's teaching. We've had many nurses with their health program this year who've used Nearpod to you know, make their lessons more engaging, make it more interactive with their students. And we also have a bunch of science teachers at the middle school who've really taken on to this. Uh, another one of the favorites of the teachers at the high school, uh, what we see here is what's called Today's Meet. And Today's Meet is a digital platform that creates what we call a back channel within the classroom. So to give you sort of an example, um, you could have a debate going on in your classroom. The teacher can be sort of orchestrating the debate. And you've got two teams for the debate and, and maybe a third team. And maybe that third team comprises of maybe some students that are a little bit more reluctant to sort of speak up in class. Well, they can sort of be running the back channel there while the debate is going on and there they are with their iPads or even their computers and sort of offering up their own sort of, um, sort of input into the debate, but they're doing it all via the computer and not sort of verbalizing it. So this is a great platform for many things, but that's just an example of one. Educreations is another app that we use a lot at the elementary level. In basic, what it is is a screencasting app where people can record on an iPad or even a computer now 
um, different videos, different um, presentations about what they want students to learn. We've kind of flipped it, if you will. Our students are now creating these education videos. The group of fourth graders you see here are working with um, a subtraction concept. And they're actually coming up with the explanation on how to solve the problem. So they're working in small groups. They're making a education's very two-minute video. They put the steps on the video. They then narrate the steps to the video. And then they can put it on their website. Other students can go to it to practice what they're learning. And it really engages the students and makes it a lot more interactive. And then we have Wii Video. Uh, for years now, teachers have been using uh, Microsoft Movie Maker or you know iMovie in the classroom. The problem with that is you need the software on the computers in order to sort of execute your lesson. Uh, Wii Video uh, has gained some traction within the high school and the two middle schools that I'm working with because it's web-based. So st you know students and teachers can go on irrespective of whether they've got the software and they can produce a movie or a film. Um, they could edit it all within the web and the internet, and it's free, so it's great. And then the last one we wanted to mention was um, two in particular, SoundCloud and QR, or quick response codes. Um, one of the things when I started in this position last year is we knew how busy teachers were, and we knew that technology really should be infused into all the other curriculums that we are using in Westfield. Um, last year, our elementary teachers especially started off with the reading and writing project, and we knew that one of the ways to get them to infuse technology is to see the benefit it could be to that particular curriculum. So what happens with SoundCloud, it's an audio program that with just a basic laptop and a microphone, you can record <coughs> students reading whatever they have written. So in this case, this is actually a kindergartner who wrote a book about his nonfiction topic and, you know, a minute long for kindergarten, but we recorded him reading his work and it was a good thing because merge and spelling <laughs> in kindergarten, but he could put a voice to his work. Um, we made a quick response code, kind of like the one you see up there, and we put it on his book so he can take it home and parents, if they have a mobile device that has a reader on there, can scan it and listen to him reading, you know, not just now, but into the future. Um, a second grade class did it with poetry. The teacher expressed that, you know, students were learning about writing poetry, you know, but she didn't always feel that they voiced their poetry or they could read it with the fluency that they needed to. So she worked a lot on that and she had them read all their particular poems and wanted this as a way that if parents were coming into the building, they could hear the students reading their poems. And we've also done it with book trailers for our um, older kids where they've finished reading a novel, they've written a review of the book, they record it on SoundCloud, we make a QR code that goes onto the actual novel that lives in the classroom library, and when they have what we call book shopping at the elementary level, if they have the iPads available or some other device, they can then scan it and they can hear their other classmates telling them about the book and decide if that's one that they want to read. So with all of this, obviously it's a lot. <laughs> it's a learning curve for many teachers, and the biggest part is really, I feel, the professional development. And we have a great opportunity in the position that we're in to develop, to develop and to deliver professional development to our teachers. Um, the ways we have done it within our position, a large chunk of it is our after-school professional development that teachers sign up for and come to. Um, this year it was a lot of headline because we needed to get our teachers on that, but we did have many other types of offerings for them. Adam and I spent a lot of time in one-on-one -on -one consultations with the teachers because of our flexible scheduling. We can kind of work with their schedule and meet with them when it's convenient for them during lunch times, prep periods before or after school. Um, we've also started developing a lot of screencasts this year mainly for Edline, but we're looking forward to making more of them for other educational technology tools. And Adam's worked with a lot with PLCs and pilots at the middle and high school level. All right, so that's kind of a, a summary of what we've done, how we've sort of implemented the vision, uh, you know, by the district. Um, of course, we're going to continue to do that type of work, but we're always sort of thinking about what's next. And again, this stuff is moving so quickly, so we're trying to stay ahead of it as well. Um, we've got some ideas up here that we would love some input on, but uh, we're thinking about a Westfield Summer Institute with respect to professional development. Obviously, this summer, especially for the Edline uh, content management system, uh, but any other type of digital platforms as well. Um, we've spoken about in other meetings um, the Student Genius Bar at Westfield High School. Um, I'm in talks with uh, Mr. Renwick, Brian Auker, 
um, and even some math teachers and science teachers and computer science teachers, sorry, to give me a list of some students that would be able to sort of resource and staff that student genius bar. And we've got some other ideas up there as well, but certainly a lot of foreign language teachers are thinking about communicating in the classroom and outside of the classroom, even within other countries. So we've, talking, we've spoken about you know, Skype in the classroom and Google Hangouts, things like that, um, as a going forward basis. And we just want to take a minute to, you know, this is the end of our presentation. We obviously want to open it up for comments, but Adam and I personally want to thank the board, and we also want to thank the um, board tech committee for their support. Um, we definitely want to thank Dr. Dolan and Paul Panero for their continued support of what we do every day. Um, we spent a lot of time, obviously, with the learning management system of Edline this year. Those people have been invaluable to us. Um, Lori Karecki, in particular, has been very supportive and very helpful to us as a group. We are neighbors in our location, but her input has been invaluable. And also the administrators, supervisors, and the staff in our district. I'm, not that I'm telling you anything you don't know. They work extremely hard. And they've been very receptive to every time we come into the building, you know, working with us, giving us feedback. And they've worked very hard to get this headline initiative especially off and rolling. So we wanted to thank all of you for that and thank you for having us and open it up to any questions you may have. Yeah. So as chair of the committee, I want to thank you. <laughs> Give it right back to you. Um, you know, I think our vision when we started all this with, 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 uh, with Paul Pinero uh, two years ago, um, I think this is exceeding where we thought we would be at this point, and, and that is all from the instructional side, and that's really because of the work that both of you have done, and Janine, you know, certainly in the prior year. Um, so thank you for that. This is really, it's really exciting, and I think it's heading in the direction that we want to see it. Um, a couple of specific questions. I was curious, which, you know, how the BYOD thing is going, the pilots in the high school, and you know, I know you're not ready to give final results or anything, but I'm just kind of curious, and what you're finding, and just some initial thoughts. Okay, so as of right now, with the BYOD in the high school, Mary Svendis, Vice Principal at Westfield High School, sort of, uh, you know, organized that pilot. Uh, what she asked for was some access for, I believe, 100 or down, uh, you know, uh, students. Mm -hmm. um, so she began to enroll those. They began to enroll themselves with Arvin Vidal to get hooked up um, on the wireless access there. And they've had maybe three or four pilot meetings. They've discussed pros and cons. Um, as far as BYOD for a next year initiative, um, one, the wireless, which we're looking forward to over the summer, is going to be upgraded. That's number one. And two is that I spoke to Arvin about this. We absolutely have to get some policies in place with respect to what does it truly mean to be BYOD at the high school, i.e., uh, does it mean that kids are bringing in cell phones and that counts as a device, or is it iPads, right. or sort of a... Uh, we have to kind of get the policies in order as far as what it all means. Right. No, we'd love your input, certainly, mm -hmm. as... Uh, and and Gretchen will you know, handle that from the policy side and the technology committee will certainly give some thoughts, but we definitely need... Just know, draw off the specs, yeah, basically. Exactly, exactly. Um, you mentioned professional development, which obviously is critical in the technology world. In, in your view for next school year, how, do you think there needs to be additional professional development days to do this? What, what are some of your thoughts? Yes, I think that's something that our teachers want and that we need. I mean. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like I said, we've made it work, but there's a lot of teachers who, even with all the options we have out there, their lives, their schedules, it just doesn't fit in. And I feel like when you have people for, you know, a good chunk of time where everyone's there, it's not, you know, necessarily just after school or at our lunch break and everyone's focused, I, I feel you get a little bit more out of your professional development that way. Mm -hmm. It's more, you know, rigorous, it's more planned, it's more, you know... In, perfect, in a perfect world, the, the idea of having a PD after a teacher has taught five to six classes, that, that's, that's tough. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying, you know, I, I understand the, the situation and the circumstances, that's when we can have it. Um, but as far as the idea of taking in new stuff well, when they're not fresh anymore, that, that was a challenge. Um, so the after school PDs are a little bit of a challenge with, that res with respect to that. Um, but the idea of, you know, maybe offering a PD to start the day or somewhere in the beginning would would be ideal. Mm -hmm. Okay. The last thing I just want to ask about this, of course, I'm going to ask. Um, I know that we're being initiating Facebook in the fall, um, in in our um, you know on the website. But I'm just curious, just in, in general, some of your from the instructional side on social media, um, just some general thoughts that you may have. 
I mean, as far as, you know, I tend to focus more on the elementary, obviously, because that is my position, even though I work with all the teachers with Edline. Um, the way I focus was not really in the classroom, obviously, with it. I've been encouraging my teachers with Twitter to go on as a professional on Twitter and to follow different people in different areas of education, not just educational technology. I myself have learned, I can't even tell you how much from my interactions on Twitter and the different, you know, Twitter chats and different groups that I'm involved in and different, you know, connections I've made through Twitter. So that's how I tend to approach it with my teachers. My, my group <coughs> is a little too young to be mm -hmm. using social media in the classroom, but as a, another professional development resource, that's where I've seen, you know, great growth. Right. Yeah, I'll echo that. I mean, as far as from a professional standpoint, um, all the conferences we go to and attend, um, and all the, the people in our position, they are using Twitter. They're using it amongst themselves, and they're using it with their students appropriately, of course. But as far as from a social media standpoint, Twitter, as far as learning, putting kids in groups and categories, and actually be able to have you know discussion, like rich discussion, Twitter is right now the easiest platform to do that. Great. Very exciting. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, very informative and... Uh, so I'm wondering about the, uh, the level of competition within the classroom for devices. What, what are you seeing and um, how are you managing? Um, since, like I said, with elementary, it's the iPad cart that gets a lot of competition. Um, when we started last year with the initiative, it was slow to start. But I think as other teachers saw what other teachers were doing or saw what you know, resources I have provided for them, the competition for those carts, and not just the iPad carts, but now the laptop carts, has increased. I can go into some schools sometimes and have a teacher who wants me to come in and do a lesson, and you know, whereas the beginning of you know the past school year it might have been I can come in the next day, I might have to wait a week to get into that classroom. So our teachers are using them, and they are you know doing a lot with them. So there is you know competition in that way. I don't think it's too not too fierce. fierce. <laughs> You're very nice about it. <laughs> It's a, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, when we upped the game with respect to how many carts we had, at least at the high school level, that helped for sure, and we welcome more of that, of course. Um, moving forward into the, the year, two years out, the, I, the idea of teachers fully adopting instructional technology, in an ideal situation, they're either BYOD or we provided a one-to-one -one environment for them via you know, Chromebooks or you know, some HP laptops, whatever. But if we're really moving in the direction again, which is I think what we're doing, BYOD, where the kids have the devices themselves, or we provided it for them, where it's not a question of like going down and having to rent out a limited resource at this point, and the teacher having to go through that step. If, if they're sitting there and they're in the room already and the teacher has made it part of the fabric of their class, that's the ideal situation. Thank you. I do have a follow-up. Um, and Dr. Dolan, this is really, for you and um, when you and your administrators will be ready to give us your vision for uh, either master technology teacher infusion or um, other instructional technology professionals through the schools or within the classrooms. Um, I'm anxious to hear. Um, so I, I'm not going to ask you tonight okay. until you're ready to um, you know, tell us what you're thinking uh, I'm looking forward to hearing where you think this is all going. Okay. So real quickly, is there anything you would want the board to know moving forward? I know you said staying ahead of the game, where it does move so quickly. Is there any, you know, roadblocks that you foresee, either with infrastructure or the educational side, <laughs> that we should know about, that we should be planning ahead for? Um, you know, to give us some idea that you might know already that we can't use this program because of this or, you know, is there anything that you can... The challenges here at the high school clearly was the wireless access. Okay. Um, we did a great job of putting a Band-Aid on the situation for this year. Uh, you know, fingers crossed that this summer as things move forward and, you know, we get stronger wireless connectivity within the high school. Okay. The teachers and the students will actually see that it's that's fully there and they'll begin using it even more and there'll be no hesitation by the part of the teachers. I don't know if I want to go there. Janine mentioned an app before called Nearpod. You know, I had teachers this year, you know, rent out the carts, line up their lessons, design their lessons and then uh, yes, the signal failed. 
And so then they had to go to plan B right there in front of you know, the kids, which is that's part of teaching. Um, but once that is taken out of the equation and we have strong wireless connectivity, uh, that's, that's going to be moving us in a great direction. I don't think it'll fix everything, but it'll definitely be moving in the right direction. And that should be done this summer. Yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan for the summer. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think Mitch already hit on the other big one, is the PD, the professional development time, the time to work with our teachers, mm -hmm. the time to give our teachers to work Absolutely. and learn about that. Um, especially, you know, obviously with the digital tools, with the 21st century learning, but with Edline. You know, granted, we've launched, we started off, you know, we're working, we're continuing to offer PD to our teachers. The second level of over the summer, there's going to be a lot of PD they're still going to need in order to get to that next level and to turn it fully into a learning management system and not just a public facing website that parents can come to and maybe get certain pieces of information. We really want to train them how they can use it to run their classrooms and to make you know the learning environment that their students need and their students are going to be expecting for them. So we need to continue that going forward next year. And I'll just piggyback on one other thing. I was talking to Dr. Dolan, I think, last week about this. In the last two years, the change with respect to instructional technology, it, the, the rate of change compared to any other years before that, it, it's been astronomical. Teachers, this is, a, some, this is a new game for many of the teachers, so as much PD as we can get to some of these teachers that are maybe not as digitally savvy as you know, some of the ones that have been working with technology, uh, the better. So you know, some of them are getting comfortable, but we need to make them more comfortable. And there's so much change within the last two years mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. for some, they're a little reluctant to jump in and we want to help them with that. Who makes the final decision on what digital tools are, are purchased, sort of which direction we go? Well, it's very interesting because many of the digital tools do not require purchasing for us. A lot of the ones we use are completely free. They're out there. There are certain levels. Like, for example, in Nearpod, most of the things we need to do in our classrooms with Nearpod are free. There's other levels of it if you wanted to go there. Um, Adam and I research them and we make recommendations, but Brian Alker, the informational technology department, obviously would handle the purchasing of any. <coughs> any requests I've gotten for anything that's been, yeah, that requires money, uh, first we take it to the supervisor, it goes up, and the principal gets involved. And then we talked to Brian about maybe a purchase, but after it's been fully flushed out and there's been a rationale established. But again, as Janine alluded to, a lot of these apps are free to a certain level. Speak that so was about, how is, oh, <coughs> okay, go ahead. I, we're probably gonna ask the same question. How is the content monitored? In other words, how, who, how are we <laughs> making sure that the information that's being mm -hmm. pulled up and yeah, I mean, they look fantastic, yes. but how do we know mm -hmm. it, it coincides with our curriculum? Well, the great thing a lot about a lot of these tools are you're taking the curriculum you're already using and the content you're already using and just presenting it in a digital fashion. When it comes to certain things like apps, I know we might have mentioned this last year, any apps that teachers would like to put on any of our iPad carts have to go through a review process that starts with Adam and I from a technology, technology standpoint and then goes to that department, excuse me, not department supervisor, curriculum supervisor for their review to make sure that it aligns with the curriculum that they are putting out to our students in the district and also the principals and supervisors like we said. So for instance, that blend space, that's, those are, it, it almost sounded to me like there were already lessons embedded in that website that teachers were then using. Am I, did I misunderstand? Oh no, they were constructed. They're yeah, constructed. That, was a, that was a blank template and then the teacher has the, the chance to construct the lesson as mm -hmm. they go. Got it, thank you. So one more quick question speaking of apps, just so we can explain to the public. that Because um, you said you're piloting the Google apps. So I think to most people, an app is an app. So why would you need to pilot it? So could you just explain that a little bit? So Google Apps for Education uh, is one of the biggest things going on in instructional technology today. And what we've done is, is we've uh, you know, basically taken a couple of teachers that are interested in piloting it and given an account, a Google account, sponsored by Westfield and JK12.org, uh, to the teacher and to their students within the class. And so what happens is now the teacher and the student are sort of connected via Google, uh, sponsored by Westfield. Um, and with that, the teacher can create and collaborate on documents, on PowerPoint slides, on Excel spreadsheets, if you will, uh, via the Google suite of, of tools. Right. Um, it's all dynamic, it's all real time, and you know, we put it on a PowerPoint slide before, uh, the three C's, the collaboration, the communication, and the Google suite of apps is one of the, the strongest ways to get there. 
So I, the pilots, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the pilots right. more about obviously instructing students how to correctly use, use this it. type of platform and how teachers <coughs> can use this platform. So while those tools might be not completely, like you said, new to everyone, it's how do you use that within your classroom and how do students use it appropriately for their learning. It's just so powerful. I just wanted you to explain mm -hmm. that so people understood because yeah. I'm sure the teachers are liking it, mm -hmm. the ones that are piloting it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think sometimes it gets miskewed that it's just an app, you know, and then it loses how mm -hmm. much Powerful is behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And these, this app and the, and the suite was what was used within the humanities pilot. Jackie Spring and Caitlin. They were actually yes. using uh, what's called Evernote, which okay. is a very, it's a yeah. similar similar. Framework, okay. digital framework where, you know, you can definitely collaborate. Um, with Evernote, they're just digital notes. Mm -hmm. um, so you can share the digital notes, which is great. Uh, Google takes it to a little bit of its scale to a little bit larger of a level where you have um, anything from Microsoft Documents to right. Excel spreadsheets all in the Google form. So who's using that? Um, who's using the platform right now as a, as a pilot? Right now we've got about eight to ten teachers that have signed on within the last month to, tr to sort of pilot it and uh, see what the results look like and so far so good. Any downsides to Google Apps for Education? Uh, any downsides? Uh, as far as Google Apps for Education versus your Microsoft suite, Microsoft sits on the computer a little stronger as far as the processing and what's possible on a Microsoft document versus a Google Doc or a Microsoft Excel worksheet versus a Google Sheet. Um, but as far as Microsoft versus Google with respect to dynamic collaboration between teacher and student or student to student, uh, no comparison. Right yeah, especially now. with Microsoft launching their Office suite for the iPad relatively recently. Uh, not still again not as I mean I know yeah. the office suite costs money but yeah and Google you know that collaborative cool. piece the real time collaboration right. you know that you would thank you so much not only for the presentation but for all the work that you're doing the headline was a tremendous task and uh, we appreciate the work you did with teachers and staff because it's hard and there was a lot they needed to do this year so this was something else so we really appreciate that I have one quick question and then a bigger question. I was just wondering if you could tell everybody what we'll PDL take a quick is. <laughs> problem-based learning. Um, yes. So in problem-based learning, students are presented with a problem. And through working collaboratively to solve that problem, they are learning the skills that normally would have been presented to them by a teacher. Um, they're using critical thinking skills, communication skills, researching skills, and now technology to kind of work together to solve a problem. <coughs> at least that's, you know, when we work it at an elementary level, that tends to be how we do it. Yeah, it takes a couple different titles. Sometimes it's challenge-based learning. Sometimes it's project-based learning or problem-based learning. It, your different iterations there but it's the idea yeah it's the idea where the the students are sort of thrown a challenge uh, at the outset of the or the onset of the lesson and from there on in we work backwards as teachers and students work backwards and it's the idea of creating authentic challenging lessons for the students to sort of work themselves through two to three weeks um, where at the end there's a culminating activity or there's a culminating presentation and with that one of the trends is the idea of taking now that technology is available project-based learning or challenge-based learning um, is, is becoming uh, a little bit uh, stronger of an offering, if you will. It's, it's easier to execute on a project-based learning model now uh, than it was five years ago. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other question is um, the difference between a learning management system and a content management system, and is Edline really a learning management system, and then how does that work in collaboration with one of the C's or not with Google Apps? Great questions. Um, we phased in Edline this year. Uh, so right now I would probably say it's more of a content management system. Um, as we bring students on board and parents on board next year, it becomes, it starts to move from a content management system where the teacher is just posting static documents to now next year the, uh, the teacher has students in his or her class and now they can have, start having discussions online in groups with the students. They can start having blog entries posted by the teacher and the student. Becomes a little bit more of a learning management system in that sort of context. Um, there are some tools 
um, that we can add on to the Edline platform. Uh, things like uh, homework hand-ins, quiz generators, um, there is an explore feature that we can do where we can pull in data and research um, as a tool. But as we add those layers, yes, it begins to move even more towards a learning management system. And how does it fit together with Google Apps? Uh, most schools are running either a content management system or a learning management system. They, oh, there is no, I've yet to see one, a perfect learning management system out there that does everything. Um, so the way we're looking at it right now is we'll have Edline as the base and then we can sort of layer on Google Apps for Education uh, where you can get that collaborative piece between teacher and student and student to student. But they can work hand in hand. Just one, one more. Um, you mentioned the areas that you're focusing on and that you'd like us to focus on is um, extending wireless access professional development and uh, policies regarding uh, bring your own device. And is there anything else that the board should be looking at to further your ability to get your work done and, and get technology inside the classrooms and to our kids? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, the board has been great and Paul Panero's office has been great about sending us to professional development as well. You know, obviously, through Twitter, through you know other connections that we have, we can learn a lot about it. But we also need to be in there and you know on the front lines, figuring out you know how it works best in classrooms. I, we've gone to other districts to visit other districts, so the time to do that, um, and just like the teachers, we need the time. We're going to have a lot of work over the summer that we're going to need to do, especially to get Edline rolling for the next school year, and also to set up our professional development plan outside of Edline for the following school year. So we need the time to work, and we're happy to have the time to work if you will give it to us. <laughs> okay. Great. But if you give us a strong wireless connection in the high school, yeah. that's fine. You're getting it. I'm told you, I'm told you're getting it. Golden, right? This Golden. summer. Golden. Golden. No, thank you for everything. We appreciate you thank having you. us, and we thank appreciate you. all your support. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. very much. Thank you. All right. All right, the next um, presentation tonight is also about a topic that we've talked about throughout the year. This is the first year we're using um, a, a new evaluation for teachers called the Marshall Evaluation Model. And as part of that, we um, this year um, established a survey to check with people. It is brand new, very different, required professional development, and we wanted to just get a pulse of how are we doing, what do we need to, to change and improve going forward. So a short summary of how the survey uh, went. So we did um, implement the Marshall Evaluation System at the very, starting at the very beginning of the year. Um, so that was implemented for all of our teaching staff, approximately 572 people, as well as for administrators. And to date, just for teachers, now we have 572 teachers, our administrators, our principals, vice principals, and supervisors have completed over 3,000 observations since, since September, over 3,000. Um, clearly, uh, people have been busy in the schools, no question regarding that. Uh, we surveyed the staff in March, so we know we're not quite through a year, but we did want to get a sense of how we were doing up to there. Uh, and we had 513 teachers who did respond to the survey. Um, some of the first parts are just a bit interesting. How many years, including this year, have you been in education? And you can see for yourself the numbers there. Um, and our, 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 our largest groups in that area. And, and I find it interesting, if you go to the next slide, um, this one focuses on how many years have you been in Westfield. And it's, it's much more even among the, the various groups. So clearly part of it is we tend to, we certainly hire some people right out of school, but we also are able to attract people who have had experiences elsewhere and come to Westfield. Um, this chart in and of itself doesn't have much to do at this point with Marshall, however, um, it's great because what you want, in my view, is you want a mixture. You want some people coming out with the newest ideas and great training and the latest technology so, so people are rather fresh to, um, to education. And you want people at different parts in their career. It makes, I think, uh, I think we can learn a lot from people who have been teachers for a long time and every other group in between. So we're in a, a good place in our district, I would say. So one of the questions we asked in the survey was, what was most helpful about the Marshall model? 
And these were the top three choices. They found that the mini observations, mini observations, they are all unannounced. Um, administrators just go into the classroom and they are in there. They're not in there for full class. That's why it's called mini. Uh, they are in there for part of the class. The administrators make sure that they attend to some of the beginnings of classes, some of the ends and some of the middles so they get a sense of how things go. Uh, so 90% of the teachers felt as though those were helpful. Uh, they also thought the post-observation conferences were helpful, as well as the ongoing communication with administrators and supervisors. Uh, with um, six, um, actually basically a minimum of six mini observations a year, after each one of those, you sit down with your administrator or supervisor and have a conversation focused on that lesson and your work. Um, and so that was appreciated by teachers as well. Over 70% of the teachers responded that the Marshall model has impacted their communication with parents, data analysis, and student assessment. Um, some of the data analysis and student assessment is tied to another aspect of the evaluation system, which are the SGOs, or the student growth objectives. All of the teachers have student growth objectives, and um, so some of the conversation at their meetings with administrators has to do with data analysis and student assessment. We also had uh, an open area on the survey, just asking people, so what, would, what else would you like us to know, a question you didn't ask, et cetera. And we did have hundreds of teachers who did respond. And um, there, were, there were certainly some patterns in it. I will just read um, a handful of them. Um, and most of the ones I'm reading are representative where we, we had a number of people saying it. Uh, one teacher wrote, I appreciate the more frequent mini observations. I think it enhances and facilitates dialogue between teachers and supervisors. All of this is helpful to improving teaching and better override, I'm oh, sorry, better overall school-wide communication. I much prefer to the other models of observation. I think it enhances school community dialogue and communication. Another, another teacher said, I believe I was prepared to create SGOs, or student growth objectives, and to be observed due to the amount of exposure I had to the new plan being implemented. I appreciate having the opportunity to discuss, argue, and observation. I felt I didn't go well. Um, I'm another uh, person, clearly a counselor, said, a lot is required to tailor the specific data collection relating to counseling. And that there is a trend there for some of the, uh, depending on what your role is in a school, um, some of the data collection or some of the evaluations um, don't quite fit. You know, we, everybody does not have the same job. Um, and that, that came through in a number of comments as well, and something we know we need to continue to work on. Another teacher, it works well for me. I appreciate that observations are done without notice and that there are multiple observations. I also like the self-assessment rubric and it becomes the focus of your annual review. Another comment similar to one before, that it is not realistic for every discipline. Again, that's a recurrent theme. I think I have one more to share. Um, this one focuses on, uh, okay, I like being observed many times a year and at different points in a class period. I disagree with some of the Marshall rubric items and don't think that all categories are indicators of a good teacher. Also, some key items are missing from the rubric. Things like teacher-student relationships, innovation, technology, et cetera, aren't considered. And um, that has been a conversation even at our district evaluation committee and um, in, in conversations between administrators and, and teachers. Um, there's a lot in the Marshall rubrics that are very good and um, focused teachers and administrators are important aspects of teaching. And there are other where we think we could probably write it better if, we're, if we were allowed. Um, luckily, we do communicate with Marshall, uh, Kim Marshall, the person who created the system, and so um, we may be able to tweak that going forward. A lot of it is quite good, but we certainly don't agree with every aspect of the, of the rubric. So I appreciate the fact that the teachers uh, did respond in such large numbers and did give us feedback that is important. I'm pleased that overall um, they believe and the administrators believe this is a good system. Um, it, is, um, it is helping everyone focus on instruction in the classroom, which is why we exist. And um, I, I think it's, uh, I'm very happy that so many people worked so hard to make sure on this first year of implementation that it was worthwhile and that it benefited the students who were learning in the class, which is, which is the whole point. So. Thank you. Any comments or questions? I have a follow-up question on the mechanics of the Marshall rubrics. Is there, 
is there a steering committee mm -hmm. or some kind of interaction with Kim Marshall for talking about these, these rubrics and the assessment processes? So a few things. Um, in the district, there is a district evaluation committee. We uh, has had, yes, uh, it used to be called our joint staff evaluation committee, but then the state made us call it DIAC. Would not have been my choice, but um, <laughs> but in any case, regardless of the name, it is made up of teachers and administrators in the district. We meet monthly. Um, it is a very good group. Actually, Rosanna's on it. Um, it. it it is a thoughtful group, and they gather information from the schools and observations, so we continue to work on that. That's one part of it. Um, also, uh, Barbara Ball is, uh, has been involved in a, um, a, a PLC, Professional Learning Community, of various districts in this area who use Marshall, and they've talked about um, how to address, um, you know, how the rubrics, whether they address counseling or other areas. Um, we have not gotten the okay from the state yet to change any language. We have funneled some information back directly to Kim Marshall for suggestions, um, but I'd say there's more work to go in that area. Okay. So there is some room for influence over time. I believe so. Uh, Kim actually is very easy to communicate with, but again, he has to make sure that the state will allow the rubric to be mm -hmm. changed. Um, I think that the, the amount of comments that the teachers provided was tremendous and full of wonderful information for the district to really cull through and do even better. Um, one thing that was repeated in many of the comments was that people were really happy that we went with the Marshall model instead of Danielson or Marzano or some of the others because they're hearing from colleagues in other districts about their challenges, which while there are challenges with any new implementation, um, the teachers here felt like their challenges were less. So I think that's something to point out as well, because the, the DIAC took their time and didn't, right. and as did you, didn't jump right into the first things that were option, you know, the, the first options, so. That's right. That's good. The committee did a great job reviewing all of the options that we were allowed by the state, and I do think they chose the one that um, is most appropriate for Westfield, so I'm glad that they did that. Well, they chose. They recommended to me, I chose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the DIAC committee, the joint um, evaluation committee, did they uh, build the survey to start with? Yes. they. Um, uh, we worked on it as a committee, and then there was a subcommittee of the committee okay. who worked on the surveys, correct? And, and that is the group then who has um, access to the results? Yes. And the comments? Which is why Rosanne I has knew about it. access right. to That's the comments. That's exactly right. Thank you. That's exactly right. Anyone else? All right. No, thank you. All right, so then moving to the main agenda, I would recognize the public for agenda items only. All right, seeing no one come to the podium, we will move to uh, agenda next agenda item. I'd ask the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on April 8, 2014, and the private minutes of April 8, 2014. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Any comments or questions on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, then we move to personnel. Mark uh, is not here. He didn't uh, send to me any comments. I don't know if he... No, I'll have one retirement to mention once okay. it's All right. I'd ask the board to consider personnel items one through 23. 23. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments? And I do have uh, one retirement. Sure, please. All right. Tonight I'm announcing with regret the retirement of Pat Bradley, who currently serves as Dana Sullivan's executive secretary. Pat has worked in the district since 1986, first at Washington School. She then moved to the superintendent's office, and for the last 15 years she has been in the business office. Pat is respected by her peers and has served as the secretarial association uh, in several roles including her term as co-president. Pat, Pat works easily with others and is diligent in completing tasks assigned to her. She is eagerly looking forward to spending time with her four sons, 
their wives, and her ever-growing brood of grandchildren. <laughs> and we wish her very well in her retirement with all of her grandchildren. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Dana? Ms. Matezic? Yes. Lucy Beagler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Brandy Galleon? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Roseanne. Roseanne. Yes. Jimmy Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. All right. With that, we'll go to facilities. And uh, I didn't have a prepared report, Dana. Was there anything of note that? Uh, we just said there's some resolutions in finance we could cover on that. Yeah, no, nothing else. All right, long range planning, Jeannie? The long range planning uh, committee met on April 24th. I'm going to give a brief uh, overview and um, notes will be coming soon. We discussed the four topics that board members had suggested uh, that the committee take a look at. First topic was hiring and tenure analysis. And the committee agreed that um, we could, uh, we agreed not to explore uh, the, the question that was given to us uh, any further, but we did suggest that at some point the superintendent explain the process of teacher assignment numbers based on enrollment in a further, a, few, a fuller um, conversation to the board, that there could be some um, lack of understanding or information that um, newer members of the board would not have all the information that the superintendent looks at when there is the uh, assessment of teacher need looking at enrollment numbers. Um, it's part of a process for developing the budget annually as well as uh, monitoring uh, enrollment growth through the summer for preparation of um, September. Uh, classroom assignments. The second uh, question given to us was about facility funding options, large-scale capital improvement and facility maintenance. Uh, looking at questions, although we didn't um, spend too much time on a public bond options, we did uh, all agree that we had to work on uh, corporate sponsorship uh, policy definition of uh, the uh, the board's expectation for different kind of funding models that public groups are bringing to us as well as uh, the possibility for corporate sponsorship in the future. And we also spent considerable time talking about uh, delving further into development fund um, as a fundraising uh, initiative. Uh, we uh, asked for research and Lucy agreed to do some research for into some of the more successful uh, local development funds. Uh, so she has initiated that. Uh, we talked about some uh, holding perhaps a brainstorming session with public members of the public who have been uh, either successful in fundraising for other organizations or who uh, might share a dedicated interest to the school system. Uh, for um, their ideas about fundraising and initiatives within the community. So we are going to move forward uh, with a little more research and, and conversation in that area. Um, we talked about uh, the third item was building a sustainable operating budget. Um, and I believe the Finance Committee has already initiated uh, conversations in those areas, looking at first looking at um, the cost of special education and some of the uh, specific uh, cost drivers in special education, including transportation. Um, so we uh, we felt that the Finance Committee was on their way, trying to help us understand. Uh, how, how we can manage a growing budget and, and l at least looking at cost areas to try to contain in the near future. Uh, and the last area that was presented to us as a possible topic was high school college, the, the college placement outcomes for high school students. We, we recommend that the data be passed along to um, Maureen Mazaris in the counseling 
high school guidance and counseling area uh, for review. Um, and also that she look into the, um, our, some of our surrounding um, high schools to see how we compare with our placements relative to other uh, community placements. Um, the next topic that the board, that the Long Range Planning Committee discussed was Jefferson first grade enrollment. We had uh, Principal Jean Muniz, Muniz attend the meeting, uh, coming to us with uh, concerns over her um, first grade enrollment numbers, um, which are uh, getting very close to capacity. She has no extra rooms in her building, and she has uh, four sections of first grade at 21 right now. And so we, um, we talked at length about the possibilities of, uh, we talked at length about the, the fact that uh, we're seeing considerable um, construction in the Jefferson community. Uh, tear down, housing tear downs have started again. Um, and so that there is anticipation that while elementary enrollment numbers may be decreasing a bit across the district, uh, we think that there are higher numbers now and in the near future uh, within Jefferson area. Um, and so we asked um, the principal, Muniz, to watch very carefully for her numbers uh, and enrollments, uh, especially in the first grade, when they get to 22, to be uh, cognizant and call the superintendent so that uh, a message to potential enrollees who have first graders after that point could be given with um, uh, reasonable information about the fact that there may not be a guarantee that individuals in first grade could be placed in Jefferson School, but that other schools would welcome those students. And I'd like, you know, Dr. Dolan can come on, on that, but we, it really is a recommendation from us to the, to the board as to how we can approach that, that ma management of those numbers. Um, yes. Present. I have a question. Because Franklin has historically had that high class size yes. in first grade. Um, and grades going fur further, right. you know, up in the grades as well, right. and sometimes even 24 and 25, maybe not in first not grade, in first although grade. I think in one year there was one really right. large yes. cohort in Franklin where they were 24, 25, 26 throughout their year except second grade when we were able to give another section. So I'm just wondering so, so for the, right. equity, why is sure this right. coming to bubble so for so Jefferson the, when in the past this is sort of status quo for Franklin? Well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. So, yes so no. Fir first grades <laughs> absolutely grow more than any other grade going into next year. So right, they will grow. We will have more people registering, even though we've had registration mm -hmm. already. More people will move into Westfield for first grade, and more people who are already here will register late. That, that's just a case. So it's more planning ahead. We're not worried about 21. We, we're, we're not really worried about 22, but we're worried if it starts to move after that, a higher number, we try to keep the first grade lower. So this is planning ahead. This is not we need to change it now. And as a matter of fact, one of the things we talked about was that Mrs. Munoz would send a letter home to parents to get everybody who does have a first grader who's already in town mm -hmm. to please uh, register your kids now. But we absolutely look, look at equity among the, uh, all of the schools. There's no question about that. Okay, I just want some clarification on um uh, Jenny, what you said about as par as more first graders coming in, them being given a message that Jefferson may not be able to accommodate them, it makes it sounds like it makes it sound like the decision is going to be made on a first come first serve basis rather than a conversation about um, where students live geographically, and it might make more sense, uh, assuming they don't have older siblings at Jefferson, for them to attend Tamaqua. So, I mean, is that was that part of the conversation? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, all of those things. I mean, 
I, I don't want to go into all of right. the different paths of conversation because it does get very complicated and it does get broader. Um, very often, you may have somebody moving in in August who is right across from the school. All right, I appreciate that. I guess I just want some clarification because now that we've brought this up in public, um, I know I'm going to get asked lots of questions about it. So I just want. Well, I think the, the questions, the question, the, the answer is that there is an awareness of uh, the potential for higher numbers mm -hmm. moving into Jefferson through the summer where we historically know that first grade numbers go up. So we're very mindful and watching. Right. So I would agree. So we're not at a problem yet, but we could absolutely get there because people move in. Okay. So I would say one thing that is um, is is done from school to school when um, when we are at that position where we have one school in whatever grade they are a little higher than we would be. If we have a request from a parent. Could you please consider? I just moved across town, and I'd like my child to stay in the school. Right. The only time we, um, I, uh, approve that is if that helps our numbers. Right. Okay. So if we have somebody in Jefferson, where they're going into first grade, but their child is in another school for some reason, whatever, or another reason, um, they can request. You know, I would really rather have my child attend this school, and if the numbers help us, then that child can attend that school. That would be our first choice. If we get to the point, and as we talked about with Jeannie, I don't think we're going to have the problem. We could, but we look back at numbers, I think we might be okay. If we do have the problem, as new students register, we're going to ask a bunch of questions. You know, are there other students in other grades? Um, is there already a child in Jefferson? Um, how far away from the school are they? How close are they to other schools? Um, so, um, so those questions will be asked and considered. Um, I wish it were, like it's a little easier if you can do a deadline, or it's a little easier if you can do something else, but life isn't that easy, I don't think. So uh, one of the messages would be, though, if you live in any of our areas, any of our neighbors, and you have somebody who's going to our schools next year and you haven't registered, please do that now. If you haven't moved in yet and you know you're buying a house, well, let us know. We'll, have a, we'll at least have that list knowing you're going to be moving in. But if, if, if you know somebody who has a child and they haven't registered, it would be a good time to call the school and get registered. It helps, helps all of our planning. Haven't, haven't we also at times put a... Um, an aid in the classroom if there were more children than we would want like yes occasionally that maybe happened. we put in yes. well sometimes we have we have asked for um, a literacy help mm -hmm. yes that's right uh, not not necessarily an, an unidentified right right aid but um, a specialist a specialist depending on on numbers and need mm -hmm. I, I don't want to true. yeah I was uh, just, raise right. this inordinately above the, the danger level. Mm -hmm. I just want, um, I want it known that, uh, that there is potential. Mm -hmm. And so this is a planning exercise. Um, and I understand that, uh, that there will be a lot of questions, but, but there won't be answers until we see the numbers. how the numbers um, arrive. The next topic that the, um, <laughs> this is the short report. This is the short report. The next, the next topic. It should have been at the meeting. <laughs> yeah. That the strategic, uh, that the long range planning uh, group that discussed was uh, the possibility of a strategic plan development um, in the next year, two years. Uh, there were a couple of hand apps that were brought to the meeting, including um, a, a timeline for the 2010 15 strategic plan just to show. Um, members of the committee, how long it takes to put a strategic plan together. Basically, it's about 18 months from the start. And also a presentation of the 2009 survey to, of the community, and that was given in December of 2009, which preceded uh, development in the spring of the uh, 10 to 15 strategic plan. So it was uh, agreed that this year that we're coming off of has been a very, um, has been st stocked with change and managing all of the different elements of change within the uh, administrative teacher community, staff community, that it would be best to take our time 
in starting to roll out the next uh, strategic planning sessions. So that was a very full meeting. All right. Any comments, questions? Thank you, Jenny. Move to policies, Gretchen. Yes, um, I would like to ask the board to consider um, policy item number one to approve those policies for second reading. Can I have a second? Second. And does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I had noticed that for the 822 school day on the regs that the half day dismissal for elementary and middle school is at 1230. And um, I think it was brought up, but I don't remember the rationale for why we wouldn't move it one 15 minutes later or earlier so that it's easier for parents to pick up their kids in half days. Right, and what I had indicated was um, it had been done that way intentionally because um, it had been the case in the past that there were sometimes half-day professional developments and if you wanted teachers from different levels to be able to meet at the same time they needed to end at the same time. Um, that doesn't mean we couldn't change it for the future but in order to do that we would have to check things. Um, some of the things that come to mind are transportation. If we were to change the time um, that's where we have our transportation set at this point for half days. Um, is that more of a problem or is that, you know, we'd have to look in and make sure that it, it wouldn't create a problem. So we could look into it, but I, I couldn't say right now we could change it by 15 minutes. I'd, I'd like us to look into it, and we could always come back to the policy. But I'd like It to seems look to into me it. it would have to be a conversation that, w that coincides with our conversation about the district calendar. Right, correct? I mean, just because we would need that much lead time if, if it's going to impact right. all those other moving pieces. Mm -hmm. So That's maybe, a good point. maybe That's when a good we point. talk about the district calendar next, which I guess would be the 15-16 district calendar, yes. and can it, we're always so far ahead of ourselves mm -hmm. that, that, that we can revisit this well. and be prepared to, to talk about whether it's feasible or not, you know, how it will impact professional development days, how it will impact transportation. Because the 14-15 is already approved. Yeah, but it, it wouldn't sure, say sure. when a half day is or isn't. It would just be the time, the start time, which well, is in the printed calendar, not on the... But if are transportation you're going to change it, you'd have to change it soon because con transportation contracts are starting to be renewed for next oh, year, and that okay. will affect some of the so contracts. That's, not, that's, that's different. That's not the calendar, but yeah. Well, I guess right, my right. point was more that we need that much lead time. Right. Like when we do the calendar, right. we need a similar amount of lead time to make yep, that kind of change. that's fine. I just wanted to... I up. think you're right. I mean, that's certainly something that gets raised a lot, mm -hmm. is... It's hard to pick up two yeah. kids from two right. different schools. Yeah. And people make it work, but it's mm -hmm. difficult. Anything else? Uh, Dan? Rich Matessa? Yes. Lucy Beagler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Brandon Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Um, I would like to also ask the board to consider um, Policy item number two to affirm the superintendent's decisions on HIV incidents 14T04, 14T05, 14R06, and 14HS04, as well as 14E06 appeal for the reasons set forth therein. Can I have a second? Second. Dana. Rich Matasek. Yes. Lucy Beagler. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kerstead. Yes. Ginny Lights. Yes. Gretchen Olu. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Um, just one more quick note. We uh, originally had a meeting on the calendar for tomorrow night. That's been canceled, and Rosemary and I are going to caucus tomorrow about um, whether we need to replace that meeting or if we're how we're doing in our schedule, whether we can just stick with our scheduled main meeting. But I'll reach out to the committee and let you know as soon as I know. Thank you very much. Curriculum instruction and programs, Rosanne. I'd like to ask the board to approve the following district field trips as per attached attachment five. May I have a second? Thank you, Jimmy. Any questions or comments? Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beagler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Lizanne Kerstead? Yes. Jimmy Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's all. 
All right, uh, finance in Mark's absence, I would ask the board to consider finance motions one through 15. Do you have a second? Second. Yes, thank you. Um, Dana, do you want to just talk briefly about items one, two, and three? Sure. Um, item one is a word of contract to Chartwells for our food service program. Um, we are required once every five years to go out for RFPs for um, our food service program. And then we do we can renew the contract for five years. Um, we are in our fifth year of a contract, so we went out for RFP for next year. Um, we currently have a contract with Chartwells that guarantees us a profit of forty thousand um, dollars. The RFP that they submitted for next year is guaranteeing us a profit of one hundred sixty-six thousand dollars, which is tremendous. Most districts actually subsidize their food service program. Um, so for us to have a profit like that is really a tremendous thing. Um, we only got one other um, proposal returned from another company, and their guarantee was about 66000 So obviously this was a no-brainer. Um, and plus, we're happy with Charwell's um, to boot. So um, hopefully that will continue. Um, number two is a word of contract for the boiler replacement project at Roosevelt School. Um, this is a one of the SDA projects, so 60 percent, 40 percent. I'm sorry, of the cost of the project will be funded by the state. Um, and item number three is for gym partitions at Edison and Roosevelt. Um, these bids came in. We only got two bids on this, and they came in high, higher than what our estimate was, and higher than our budget was. Um, so we are recommending that we reject these bids and rebid it. Um, we think that with a rebid, we may be able to get more um, bidders to bid on the project and hopefully get a price closer to what our estimate is. Um, so we're recommending the rejection of the bid on number three. All right. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions on any of the finance resolutions? Dana, what was the discrepancy between the, the bids we received and what we were looking for for the, the gym doors? About $60,000. On a 170, if I remember, give or take. Yeah. So 30 percent over budget. Gotcha. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, Tina. Rich Matesic. Yes. Lucy Beeler. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kirstead. Yes. Ginny Lights. Yes. Gretchen Olick. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Thank you. Legislation, Ann. Uh, no report. All right. Technology, Mitch. Uh, no report. Um, we do have a scheduled meeting this Friday that will be, I'll let everybody know we have to reschedule the day. Right. Thank you. I'd ask the board to note the notes for the record. And wish to ask, ask if there's any unfinished business. Any new business? Any liaison reports? I would then recognize the public for questions and or comments on any matter. Seeing no one come to the podium, I'd ask the board to approve the following resolutions. Uh, resolve that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, personnel pending or anticipated litigation and pending or anticipated contract negotiations. And be it further resolved that any discussions held by the board which need not remain confidential and the results of the discussions will be made public as soon as practical. I have a second. Ginny, second. thank you. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. We are moved to private session. What you saw in the fall is what we uh, continue to do and, and drill down more and more with um, within the schools, within all teachers. In fact, um, I was able to put together that data that you understandably have been waiting for and I appreciate your patience and what that was from was New Jersey smart specific numbers and it showed us see that's useful that's we better. now have information as to uh, who participated in a program one of our programs um, for academic support and who didn't and the uh, you know the the typical and high growth percentages of that and we can do that in each area and then evaluate the effectiveness of a program now, if you plug in the percentile rank somehow associated with that, it would be useless. Um, but in that regard, we can pull the data. We're getting, we're getting uh, incredible. We're getting increasing, increasingly uh, adept at playing with those numbers. It's kind of fun, um, and uh, I think you're seeing that, especially in the areas that we really need it the most. Um, 
And so like that. So when, when we take the data and, and use it in that manner, it's very useful. The percentile ranks just don't really provide the kind of overview we need. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. Oh, I think it's Mark. I'd like the board to consider finance motions numbers 1 through 10. Uh, number 10, call out a uh, the board would like to accept a gift from, from the Westfield Coalition for the Arts for uh, $3,859 to the Westfield High School Music Department for the purchase of a new coral riser. So thank you for that. I have a second? A second. question? No, a question. Second. No, I have a second. Second. Ginny, question? Okay, Dana. Rich McKesson. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Mark Friedman. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kirstead. Yes. Ginny Lights. Yes. Gretchen Olin. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Well, actually, I do have a question. Dana, mm -hmm. it's on the um, number four, the out of district placements. Too late. Could you? No, it's not a question on the data and whether I vote no, on no, it. It's, it's, just, actually, just <laughs> it's actually a question on uh, the percentage of usage of our um, tuition line. And how we're doing? It's it's. Um, what are, where are we? Uh, for this eight seven months into the budget year, we're using. We have. So could you could you just draw together something for the board? Maybe put it in the notes Friday. Just to show what how much there's been so far compared to yeah. what our budget is. Yeah. We've had a number of um, arrivals in the district with tuition assessments that have come to us mm -hmm. and, and given that the budget is can only be based on the actual cost of students in the district at the time that the budget is struck mm -hmm. we, we can't project cost increases based on year over year uh, differences mm -hmm. so given that it would be interesting for me to see uh, how our budget is uh, being managed sure and just as an FYI the um, Finance Committee does look at um, Starting last month and for the rest of the, the year, they look at a uh, fund balance projection, which includes that line for out of district tuition um, specifically. But I can absolutely send that to you on Friday. Great. Are these uh, special ed out of district schools yes. limited to the same 2% budget no, increases? They are not. So they could they go up 10% yes, next year and we have and they do. no control Correct. over it? makes it even more fun to budget. And as a matter of fact, they can come back to us three years later and tell us they undercharged us <laughs> um, and send us bills because their actual costs were higher than what they anticipated. Can we get a P.O. box out in the Cayman Islands or something they can send those bills to? <laughs> Mark, anything else? No, sir. Legislation? Uh, no report to uh, Technology Committee, Mitch? No, we're good. Now I'd ask the board to note the notes for the record and uh, ask whether there's any unfinished business. Any new business? Any liaison reports? I would then ask, I uh, would then recognize the public for any questions or comments on any topic. Seeing no one come to the podium, uh, I would ask the board to approve the following resolutions. Resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, personnel pending or anticipated litigation and pending or anticipated contract negotiations, and be it further resolved that any discussion held by the Board which need not remain confidential and the results of the discussions will be made public as soon as practicable. Can I have a second? Ginny, thank you. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? Any opposed? We are adjourned.